so good evening uh, good morning or good night or whatever depending on the time people have logged in uh, firstly i must thank the university of colombo clinical society uh, for inviting me to deliver the first med talk for 2021 uh, it's been my privilege and honor to be the founder patron of this society the brainchild of uh, dr himal jaitalaka during his fourth year that he uh, established this society the topic i was asked to speak today is on a journey through medicine reflections on a lifetime of clinical practice and i've got uh, 30 minutes to reflect and tell you what's it all about and i hope to do so uh, though this is primarily aimed at uh, students i think uh, the older colleagues uh, who are some of my contemporaries who are listening to this i'm sure you'll enjoy uh, some of the anecdotes uh, down memory lane uh, despite unbelievable advances in technology my fascination with clinical medicine continues to grow and uh, i think that's the theme i want to uh, speak to you about and also say how that uh, that fascination continues to grow despite all the technology and that's where the so called arugam bay philosophy comes into play so the outline is given here so i start by reminiscing the past uh, talking a few things about the context then the beginnings of my career and of course i got to select uh, areas because uh, this is uh, something which which is going to last only 30 minutes and then try to bring in some reflections then i get on to the glimpse of the future and there again i uh, focus on the challenge of artificial intelligence in relation to clinical medicine and then uh, how we should respond to these challenges as clinicians so uh, reminiscing the past i think it's important to think of the context because uh, we came from this generation using telephones like that listening to radios like that uh, uh, ranging from amaradeva to the beatles on those radios books which we used to buy near maradana the, those bookstores are still there the second hand bookshops and regal cinema and so on so that was the era we grew up in and uh, soon we started facing technology in a progressive manner and uh, some of my batchmates may remember the orange colored black and white tv we were glued to during the internship uh, because the televisions came on somewhere in 1980 during our internship then we had the the cell phone which was like the a brick to carry a uh, size of a gadol brick to be honest and then the we had the computers and very soon all these were being uh, being uh, what shall i say converging into the laptop and the mobile phones and in future we'll be facing this whole issue of artificial intelligence internet of things and so on and that's going to be a different world which we will face so those of you who are in the clinical society you all were probably born at uh, somewhere around 2000 and sticking your tongue out at us at that stage while we were we were uh, doing our clinical work so anyway you have got a future and you will also have a story to tell as time goes on now parallel to this parallel to this we had a massive change in technology and uh, myocardial infarction where we managed we diagnosed with the history ecg and maybe sgot or ast which used to go up uh, which goes up with uh, which increases with a myocardial infarction that's very crude that's the sort of level of crude diagnosis we made at that stage and uh, we had uh, uh, painkillers such as morphine and a lot of prayers after that because we didn't give aspirin no statins 
no angiograms, no echocardiograms, nothing, no stents. And all those came later on. And now we've evolved to CT angiograms and 3D reconstruction of CT angiograms and uh, doing stents and doing bypass surgery and a whole host of drugs. So even though when we were interns, we managed 10 patients uh, with uh, acute illness, the 10 patients you are seeing now would have four, five-fold more uh, in, uh, investigations or interventions available. So this parallel change happened and I wanted to give you that background and then get on to the beginning. And uh, my batchmates and several of my colleagues will remember uh, Professor Chanmugam. This is one of his recent photographs. And I would like to dedicate this to him because he's not very well now. So our thoughts are with him. Uh, and uh, he was one of the first people who, uh, who influenced my career in this area of medicine, mainly in relation to case studies and uh, case histories and research. So the first paper was in fact in the Jaffna Medical Journal and uh, it was on bridging hepatic uh, necrosis in hepatitis B. Now the cases I've picked for the students, you might think that they are quite complex, but you'll realize that the thinking is very simple. As my one of my mentors, Professor Dharmadasa used to say, postgraduate medicine is in fact undergraduate medicines taught in the afternoon. Right? So there isn't much difference in the process of thinking, but it's in the factual knowledge and the depth that might, uh, depth and breadth that might differ. So uh, this was a very uh, straightforward sort of uh, investigation, but we did biopsies in paper to see and found that the necrosis actually healed uh, in these uh, people who had hepatitis B. And that's uh, a picture of the original. And then the first paper which I wrote as the first author was uh, uh, a case of Monkeyberg sclerosis and atherosclerosis. You see the calcification in the limbs here. And we compared the fact that the calcification keeps the artery patent compared to atherosclerosis where the, there is more uh, thrombosis or occlusion. And uh, we published this also in Jaffna Medical Journal. And uh, again, Prof. Shanmugam was, uh, was the person who was behind this. And uh, Dr. Lal De Silva is right now, he's uh, doing an honorary uh, professorship in Peradenia. He's an anesthetist and he, tra he trained here. And then he was in UK and he ended up in one of the top centers in the US. So these are the beginnings of uh, clinical medicine, one facet of clinical medicine, which uh, I would like to share. And now I would like to get on to uh, some of the reflections and to show you why it is so fascinating. Again, I've tried to pick my memory and get some of these cases. None of the photographs here are of my patients. Uh, they are from very similar situations from the public domain. So I've uh, uh, considered four areas. First chunk of four cases clinched by the history. Second one, spot diagnosis. Third section on unusual presentations. And finally, the importance of a comprehensive examination. Uh, and in all these, I won't take long, but I'll try to show you what really fascinated me. So in the first four, I'll be uh, describing to you uh, certain facets of the history, which made me consider those diagnoses and helped us to investigate. And of course, some of these uh, thoughts were shared by the colleagues. There are others also who came up with their ideas. Uh, then in the spot diagnosis, it's mainly visual patterns. Now, that's very important uh, for in this era of checklists. You see, those are, when you write a checklist, it is a list you're writing, it's verbal. 
But clinical diagnosis requires visual, right? You need visual patterns, visual recognition. And of course, then the other two are unusual presentations and comprehensive examination. So let me begin with this, right? So this was a, a, a person who's, the son is now a doctor actually, and uh, they were known to my brother. So they came to see me. All these are from 1980s and 1990s, except for a few which were later. And there was a bit of premature brain and that was the blood count. And she gave a funny history. A shock-like sensation when she bent her neck forwards. Okay, so any thoughts on that? Uh, I don't want answers. This is uh, not a question and answer session, but uh, try to think uh, what you what would have crossed your mind. And uh, you see, the important thing, of course, is that some of these diagnoses were made within the first 10, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, these are not instances where you do all the investigations and then you come up with a diagnosis. That's that, that's also happens, but that's the later cases. These are cases where diagnosis was made within in the first encounter. And to me, this it I recalled reading uh, limit sign in the old MacLeod. The new MacLeod doesn't have this. And from somewhere in my memory, it came round and uh, I thought, could this be B12 deficiency, especially with the pre mature grain and the macrocytes. If you notice, she had macrocytes in her blood uh, picture, in her uh, blood count. And in fact, it turned out to be B12. And uh, now you might ask, why didn't we report these? Well, these are, when you're talking of 1980s and 1990s, no computers, you are typing, you have to get your references, takes three months to get your references. There's no B12 uh, levels available and so on and so forth. So ultimately not really, uh, we didn't really report it, but there are cases in the literature of similar presentations due to B12 deficiency, that subacute combined degeneration of the cord. And that's the sort of picture you get with the MRIs uh, which are available now. We didn't have any of these those days. It was just cervical spine x-ray. And you see because of the, uh, because of the uh, demyelination and so on, you get certain changes in the, uh, the uh, weighted, T2 weighted MRIs as well as with the contrast. So that's one. Then the second one was, uh, this was fairly recent. Uh, when, uh, he was wearing a nice uh, dress and he came to Ward 41 and he had been around to two or three other uh, doctors and he mentioned about this pain right in the middle, a localized area in the chest, mid-sternal area. Uh, is there when he takes a meal, he's unwell. He was unwell, had taken some tablets and capsules. Now it was, see, he was a very fit person. Uh, cardiac investigations had been done. But I was intrigued because he was complaining of localized pain. And he was, uh, it was quite significant the way he said, I have just got a pain here, doctor. Only when I eat something and swallow, but there is one pain which is... Gone. So when a person says that you are, you are getting something when you are having food, you have to think of esophagus, of course. And I was wondering, why is this localized pain in the esophagus? Could this be an ulcer? And I asked him, what are the tablets he was taking? And he gave this. So he was on doxycycline. And then we checked the literature. Yes, doxycycline, if you, especially when it is covered with gelatin, and if you don't drink enough water, can get stuck in the esophagus and can cause an esophageal ulcer. And when I told the registrars to get an upper GI endoscopy done before reading, before reading the literature, I said, and there was this smile on their face, oh, this man is thinking of, a, of an esophageal ulcer. How can it be just a few days of 
of uh, pain. This is a report, a case report of another case from Sri Lanka on a similar instance. So again, the history, he was very specific on the history, where the pain was, when it came on. And that was the trigger, the clue to the diagnosis. The third one was fascinating. Uh, somewhere in the 1990s, when my cousin sent this lady to see me uh, with some pain running down the neck. There was some pain in the arm also. 35 years, fit looking person, not very fat, uh, not, uh, not fat, I mean, normal looking person. No obvious abnormalities or illnesses to see. She had pain while moving the neck, even though 35 years, she, now we might be quite free in doing x-rays and CT scans, but the days gone by, even an x-ray, we used to think twice, but uh, 35 year old, pain which is radiating, I was worried and did an x-ray, and this is the sort of picture we got, a small, uh, an area of narrowing of the cervical uh, disc space, interdisc space, and, uh, so this could be cervical spondylosis, but a 36 year old, right, fit looking person, I asked, uh, what are the things you do? Is there anything unusual? Do you do any neck exercises? And that was the answer, okay? Now, see, if she went on doing this, another two or three days, she might have ended up as a a quadriplegic because surgery was done fairly soon in that person. There were multiple discs in her. And this, uh, uh, you know, after that, you're very careful about, uh, about occupations and posture in relation to backache or neck pain. And please, please remember the relevant uh, occupations for Sri Lanka, right? Tree climbers with coming with backache, People who are plucking tea, our whole economy depends on them. And that's where they have the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the weight being carried, right? And they, some, they have significant injuries also here in their hands. Then the people in Peta, the Natames, who are carrying all our wholesale items from vehicles to the shops, etc. And of course, people who are sleeping on the bus and children and adults who slouch like this. And now the, the, the problem we see is because of uh, computers uh, where people are going to sleep or lying down on the bed and using their computers and having a lot of stress on the neck area as a result. So that was the third case, the third anecdote. The fourth one was fascinating. Very similar to this, uh, somewhat darker hands and feet and uh, he came to us again seen many people but admitted to ward 41 and uh, his complaint was uh, my hands are becoming dark but he also mentioned that a friend friend also has a similar problem i can picture these people now their faces and uh, can remember uh, him saying this and these were people from the lower socioeconomic group. And the thing was, they said, Api ganja no, we usually take ganja, but nothing else. And then I asked, uh, uh, are the others who are also taking ganja having this? And then he said, yes, yes, his friends seem to be having it. And that's when we discovered an epidemic of chronic arsenic poisoning in opium dependence. The opium was being smuggled from India and we believe that it was in arsenic contaminated vessels. Now, if we really worked on this and we had the assays, we could have probably ended up uh, a good publication in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, but uh, we were able to get this to the, uh, to the CMJ uh, and uh, Ms. Ba is the immunologist now in Oxford and uh, training, we sent uh, Praveen to be trained by Ms. Ba and his uh, colleagues. Uh, Dr. Susan Nadan is 
the is an orthopedic surgeon in uh, in the UK. Uh, Kanagasundaram is also in the UK. I, I haven't. Uh, uh, we don't have much contact with him and the rest of course you know uh, who are here prof sharif was with us and you'll see several papers with prof sharif's name because he was with us and he's been one of our mentors and he has been one of the people who has strengthened research in our department and of course that's damani who's my wife now prof uh, k darmadasa uh, who was uh, again one of our mentors. So I'm just telling you, the, dropping these names because as uh, you as students, you realize that some of your colleagues, 20, 30 years down the road, will end up in this, uh, in this world at top positions, right? And keep those links going because it's uh, very useful, very interesting. And it's nice to uh, talk about those uh, and remember the past. And I'm sure several of, of my batchmates are listening to this, and I'm sure you they'll also enjoy the reminiscing uh, the past. So that's in relation to some of the diagnoses which uh, which came which we came across. A few spot diagnoses. Now, uh, I've been fascinated with this hypothyroidism and the subtle features you see, and uh, have in fact. Uh, diagnosed a few while uh, while being you know there was a mango seller who was selling mangoes and i spotted that he was having hypothyroidism then there was a trishaw driver i can again visualize him getting down uh, from his trishaw uh, one day and then uh, i asked him a few questions and then there was a person who was a destitute uh, who was begging near or uh, in horton place who was also having features of hypothyroidism. And uh, what I used to do was I used to go up to them and say, you know, I'm a doctor, are you having any problems? And uh, then, uh, you know, I can send, give a small note if you can come to the clinic. Uh, and they would come because they invariably realized that there was something going on which they couldn't really pinpoint. And uh, we put, uh, kept them in the clinic and treated them uh, with uh, thyroxine. So it's quite subtle. So these are, again, pictures which will make you appreciate the subtleness of these features. Only when you compare that you can identify that slight swelling, slight swelling under the eyes, the slight puffiness, right? Here again, puffiness, a bit of thickness of the mouth, of the lips, the eyes, and again, slight puffiness and dry skin. So here you'll see, compared to this, the normal, you'll see that again, this is very subtle, difficult to diagnose. And here, you'll see, this is fairly obvious, right? Because she has got a lot of puffiness here under the eyes, and the face also has got rounded. So these are subtle features. And uh, maybe facial recognition software with machine learning will be able to uh, diagnose uh, some of these. Uh, but uh, for clinicians, we are still uh, looking at from our visual patterns. And it's a fascinating uh, exercise. The second one, again, was a facial. Uh, the diagnosis was based on the facial appearance, referred to, uh, to be investigated for acromegaly. And that was the picture. Now, uh, this is pachydermoperiosteitis. This is a subcutaneous tissue growing. That's why you've got wrinkles. And our patient also had very similar features. And in fact, he gave me a call two days ago. He's still keeping in touch. Uh, we've had to send him to some of my colleagues to, to remove some of the subcutaneous tissue because it was so heavy, it was closing his eyes, right? So this is pachydermoperiostitis. And associated with this, you get gross clubbing. It's a familial thing. My patient also had uh, two of his family members affected. So you have gross clubbing, right? And you can get a periosteal reaction. You can get a periosteal reaction. And the literature suggests this same problem which we came across. It mimics acromegaly. Again, the visual pattern was the clue. 
So visually, it's, it's different from acromegaly. Acromegaly, it's the jaw and the, uh, the forehead, and it's bony, but here it's subcutaneous tissue which uh, proliferates. The third one, we don't have a diagnosis, but uh, clinicians should, your mind should be divergent. You should be thinking of connections. And uh, the patient came with aortic dissection and had teeth like this. Uh, now, 31 year old, aortic dissection is not something common. Now, how do we tie it up? Well, my thought was, uh, my, uh, what I told the registrars was, when you have congenital syphilis, you get Hutchison's teeth, okay? When you get tertiary syphilis, you get aortic aneurysms and aortic dissections of the thoracic aorta. So the question I posed to them was, is there something in common as to why syphilis causes an aortitis affecting the ascending aorta, the thoracic aorta and dissection, as well as Hutchison's teeth, compared and is there a similar mechanism in this particular patient, 31 year old who's having aortic dissection and unusual teeth. Is it something to do with the elastin? Is it something to do with the collagen and so on? So we didn't really come to a conclusion, but that's fascinating, I thought. That was very interesting. And uh, we read about that. And uh, of course, it was uh, submitted for publication. It was published. And you'll see some of the names of the uh, co-authors here. Dilushi is there. Then uh, uh, Chaturaka, who is in New South Wales. And Dilushi and uh, Inoshi are with us in the department. Uh, Malaka is, I'm not sure exactly where he is. And that's Chandima Marasena and Raja Mantri, the surgeons who did the to the thoracic surgery. The other case was a person who came with backache and she has had this for 20 odd years. Few x-rays had been taken, but no one seemed to have bothered about it uh, until we saw this. Now, this is, uh, see, though there is no disc space narrowing, it looks white. And uh, it was Professor Dharmadasa who said, isn't there a condition called Alcaptonuria? There is something like that. Go and read up. And we did read up. And this is an inborn error of metabolism. And the pigment gets deposited, the homogenetic acid, which changes the, the uh, structure of the, of the cartilage. And finally, osteoarthritis sets in. Interestingly, uh, the urine becomes black because of a change. Uh, there's a reaction. And this patient did have uh, the, uh, this uh, symptom uh, when you asked her. And uh, we reported this in the CNJ. That's Dr. Bandula Vijay Srivartana. Again, you'll see. Uh, Prof. Sharif is here, Prof. Dharmadasa, and Dr. Sivaraman, who is doing emergency in the US. He's an emergency physician consultant. Right. Uh, so this was another interesting case where the X-ray was the clue to the diagnosis. And when you read up, you see that there are other clues which can be seen sometimes in people. In the, they have pigmentation, which you can see also in the eye. Right, so I've spoken to you on four cases where the history was a, gave a clue, uh, the precise history and uh, was the clue. But then there were another four where it was uh, the, the patterns, including the investigations, right? Now, two others. One was a periodic paralysis with low potassium. And again, 1980s, 
patient came with hypokalemic paralysis. Initially, there was a, a see, serum electrolytes were not done routinely in every patient. So this was the second admission, if I remember right. This was the second admission. First one, they thought it was Gillen Barre. And uh, then he was sent to the ICU and the potassium was found to be very low. And we investigated to find out why there was hypokalemic paralysis. Investigations revealed a rare disorder. There was distal renal tubule acidosis, but it was due to medullary sponge kidney. So there were cysts which were there in the medulla. That's Dr. Ruan Ekanaka, the famous cardiologist. D Professor Rifdi Mohideen, who was in Karapitya and now in Malaysia as professor in medicine. Dr. Lalit Mendis, my good friend, who is now uh, not practicing medicine, but uh, he's uh, known to us. And of course, Prof. Sharif and uh, late Professor Dharmadasa. So the, the interesting anecdote was that this patient migrated to the US. And uh, he had this diagnosis and he uh, went and told his physician that he's got a diagnosis uh, of medullary sponge kidney. And the, so the physician said, well, I haven't heard of this. I'll have to read up and uh, give some symptomatic treatment. And he went off. And when he went for the next visit, he said, hey, you know, you mentioned about medullary sponge kidney. Uh, I found it's the patient, the, there's a case uh, from, uh, from Sri Lanka, from your country, about this, uh, uh, about a case of medullary sponge kidney with hypokalemia. And the patient said, that's me, right? So he was, in fact, the case report that the physician there was reading about. So this is where you get cystic disease in several parts of the kidney. We are, we are familiar with the autosomal dominant polycystic kidney where you have hypertension and progressively renal failure, sometimes with uh, cerebral aneurysms. This is rare to see. And you'll see the cysts are in the medulla and causing uh, distal tubular acidosis and so on. A tubular acidosis and so on is pretty rare. The final case I want to highlight is was on the importance of comprehensive investigation, of examination. Right? So well-looking 50-year-old technician was an electrician. And so he's moving his arms all the time. And he was having pain down his left arm. He was a smoker. So exertion, movement, and smoker, you think of a ischemic heart disease. So he had undergone ECG and cervical and uh, uh, ECG as well as uh, exercise ECG, all were normal. Cervical spine x-rays were done. Uh, they were also normal. So the question was, why is he having pain down his left arm and his left radial pulse was absent? Okay. So what he really had was a subclavian nar artery narrowing. Probably because he was a heavy smoker, it was a form of peripheral vascular disease. And that's why he was having pain down his arm. So the importance of a comprehensive history. So you will see uh, the cases I've shown you, which I've described, all of them are well within the abilities of a student to detect, uh, uh, except some of the patterns might be difficult, but you should think of clinching the diagnosis based on the history. Listen carefully to what the person, patient says. Importance of visual patterns in addition to verbal lists. If you can't explain something, you must try to read up and find out whether the, how you can explain a particular problem. Just don't allow it to you know, say that, oh, this is uh, something which might be happening. It's an unusual presentation. Find out why there is an unusual presentation. And of course, a comprehensive examination. So 
these are my reflections of clinical medicine. Over the next five minutes, I want to glimpse the future and the challenge of artificial intelligence. So we have history, examination, clinical diagnosis, and we have investigations. And that's what we do now. And we are set to have a see a revolution because we are having people having with wearable devices. We are having massive advances in imaging. We are able to investigate and look at all the proteins in the blood, all the lipids in the blood, all the uh, metabolites in the blood, all the bacteria in your gut, the so-called omics, right? Omics, that's a, that's a paradigm shift. You're not talking of serum creatinine to assess your kidney function, but all the proteins and seeing the pattern which might predict renal function. And you put all these together and you have very powerful computer algorithms or machine learning to look at patterns and artificial intelligence, which will revolutionize clinical diagnosis. And some of these are already happening, even in Sri Lanka. Pathologists reports on, on, uh, on uh, pathology pictures as well as x-rays. Sometimes artificial intelligence does them better 24 seven and very fast. So let's see how things are going to change and wearable devices will give you so much of information. With internet of things and so on, they will know more about behavior of people if they want to. There'll be privacy issues, but things will change. With imaging, as imaging becomes cheaper, you'll be able to image the whole body. So all your structures, your heart will be imaged, your liver, the size of the liver. So the, you will want to know whether there is tenderness over the liver or not, but you'll be able to tell the size of the volume of the liver. You'll be able to say the stiffness of the liver with the fibroscan. So your whole physical examination is under threat. Your investigations, we use disease phenotypes at the clinical features to diagnose. Now you can use, there are preclinical criteria to diagnose. That is before the onset of disease. So pre-diabetes, pre-hypertension. And then you can think of the omics Right? Because you can start looking at the proteins which the person is producing, the metabolic picture, and you put all this into the computer and with your algorithms, follow these patients up and you will see whether some of these patterns, which I call prognostic omic clusters, some of these patterns actually predict disease later on. So what we are going to face is... Uh, the clinicians, what we are going to face is a world where imaging will look at so many of the structures, including anthropometry, data on, you won't be doing uh, BMI, you can really look at the surface of the whole body, right? You can look at the, the images of all the organs, you won't look at serum creatinine or fasting lipids, but you will have all the proteins, all the lipids, and this multi-dimensional set of data can be used by algorithms to develop diagnostic categories. So the future, uh, as I see over the next 20, 30 years is going to be different. And some of the future is already here. So how should clinicians respond to this challenge of AI? And that's where the Arugam Bay philosophy, which I coined, comes into play. I think you have to ride the wave. So students who are in the clinical society and who are listening, the undergraduates or even younger, 
you know the, the, you have to ride this wave don't give up clinical medicine clinical medicine is still fascinating but you can use technology to extend your reach and i'll show you a few things we've done so you're talking of uh, looking at the foot examining the feet for evidence of uh, neuropathy but you can actually look at the foot plantar pressures and the temperatures and see whether this is going to predict foot disease in future and this is the team from university of morocco whom we are collaborating with led by dr angela uh, de silva right and uh, varnakula surya is doing a phd and this is the area he is looking at okay so this is to predict uh, diabetic foot disease then looking at endothelial dysfunction and that again to see whether endothelial function measured non invasively will help to predict cardiovascular disease and uh, kirti priyankara who is here has already developed an innovative tool using infrared sensor and it's undergoing trials now and these are three medical students who did the elective with uh, ingendo the company with uh, kirti priyankara and kirti kurituvaku and then wrote this paper to see whether a non invasive assessment of endothelial function could predict severity of covid then there's another group we are working with in again in uh, with uh, in moratua yeah sorry so you know as clinicians i have been intrigued by this tortuosity of the scleral vessels they are very tortuous in some people not very tortuous in others so my idea was what, would this predict any sort of vascular disease and some of the work which they have done which is to take this look at the tortuosity extract it the extract the image and you must remember moratua has some of the best brains in relation to the technological advances they are graduates are grabbed by australia japan and us and they have developed this algorithms to to measure the tortuosity and preliminary studies seem to indicate that the tortuosity of the scleral vessels actually these are conjunctival vessels predict presence of diabetes or diabetic retinopathy so ladies and gentlemen my uh, talk uh, was to try and show you a few lessons from the past and also i focused on the future certain areas of the future and i think uh, as uh, as uh, youngsters facing the challenge from ai it's you should actually make use of it use the arugam bay philosophy continue your clinical medicine and extend its reach using the technologies thank you very much